And this church has done a great job historically of passing the message of Jesus Christ along, passing the call of ministry along to the next generation. I'm here because this church was good at that. I grew up in this church. If you're newer in our church body, you may not know, I grew up here, went to college, was going to go away, um, start ministry in an urban setting, get my master's degree and my MDiv, and like Carolyn, I felt a call back home, back to be in the place where I grew up, back to be in the place that cared for me and discipled me to serve back here. Each of us still has that same call to pass on the light of Jesus Christ to the next generation to continue to move this message forward. In fact, this is part of the theme of this series we're doing on the Holy Spirit. It's not just about signs and wonders. It's not just about emotional experiences with God here or or the hairs on our arms standing up, but is about the work of the kingdom continuing to move forward through the community that he has built by his spirit at Pentecost and continuing on the two next millennia of God working together in his church. And so we will see that throughout the series. Four weeks we're talking about the Holy Spirit, and then four weeks we'll look at the gifts of the Spirit specifically. How does the church operate with the Holy Spirit together? But in this series, we will today talk about the Holy Spirit as a person. What does that mean? How does that impact our lives? The Holy Spirit, the fruit that He produces in our lives, the transformation He brings. Baptism in the Holy Spirit, what does it mean that God can fill us with His presence fully? And then finally, living out a life of awareness of the Holy Spirit and living full of His guidance and His presence. This morning we are going to talk about what it means to live with the Holy Spirit as a person. I'm going to start with a story that Nikki Gumbel, uh, pastor of Trinity Brompton in England and the starter of what has become one of the largest ministries of outreach to non-believers in the last 30 years, Alpha Course, which you may have heard of, started in England and spread across the globe. He shares a story of why they do Alpha Course and why at the center of their discipleship model is teaching on the Holy Spirit. He shares a story about a man named Nigel Skelsey, who is now one of the leaders in Alpha Course and in their uh, mission of setting people free through the presence of the Spirit. He says, Nigel shared this story with them. He said, you may not know me, but I want to share my story of coming in through the Alpha Course. He said, growing up, I was a young man. I was a T-boy at a local photography magazine in England. That if you don't know because we're Americans, T-boy is literally just you brought tea or coffee to the workers there. You were the personal assistant, continual intern. What do you need? Where can I go? Go on a coffee run. So that was my job. I came in, was young in my early 20s, and just brought tea. The photography magazine I worked for went through financial mismanagement and the CEO got fired, the person under the CEO got fired, the managers, until at one point I was the highest ranking person left in the magazine and they said, should we fold or do you want to take a shot at running it? He said, I took a shot at running it. I turned the magazine around. I became the CEO of it, brought it back to being financially productive, a good magazine again. I then felt that wasn't a challenge enough, so I went and I turned around another photography magazine and brought that to financial stability again. That wasn't a challenge, so I went and started my own photography magazine, and I brought that to be successful in England. That wasn't a challenge enough, so I then became the main editor of the London, sorry, I have to, because I'm American, I have to look it up again, the Sunday Telegraph, one of the most famous and influential magazines out of London, newspapers out of London. He said, I gained power and prestige over and over again. He said, I'll tell you the reason why I was so successful. He said, two things. I hated myself, and I hated other people more than I hated myself. So I was constantly trying to prove that I had worth, but also trying to prove it by dominating and destroying others. My nickname at the newspaper was The Beast, because I would come in, transform, take names, take heads, and I would turn it around through power, intimidation, and my own sheer force of will. He said, in the middle of that, someone sent me an invite to Alpha Course to come and explore faith. He said, I was very angry, and I said, you know what, I'll give this a shot. He said, eight weeks through the course, I began to feel God was doing something or speaking something in me. He said, but I still felt like it was all in my head, 
and nothing was internalized into my heart. And I knew there was a weekend where they would teach about the Holy Spirit. I said, well, that might be what I need. I was so hungry for it that that weekend, there's four teaching sessions throughout the weekend. And in the first one, I was just annoyed because you were teaching and you took like an hour to teach. And the whole time I was like, no, just give me the Holy Spirit. In, in, engage me and invite me to know him. And I was just listening to you talk. So full disclosure, pastor, I was just sitting angry and be like, no, let me come and receive the Holy Spirit. Second session goes by. Third session goes by. We had lunch. In the third session, I was sitting so anxious. I was like, just get on with it. He said, at the end of that, you opened up the altars and gave us space to invite the Holy Spirit into our lives. He said, in that moment, immediately, I felt my life change. He said, I went from angry to feeling like I was loved and valued. He said, I understood that the Holy Spirit was God's love poured out on his people. And in that moment, I was reminded that the hate inside of me and the anger inside of me was then replaced with knowing that I was worthy of love and care by my maker. He said to him in an email afterwards, he said, I felt accepted for who I am. I felt free. Terribly cliche, I know, but I feel free now. Yesterday, I read words from Paul in Philippians, which express so deeply how I now feel about my achievements of the last 15 years. I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. As Brandon preached a few months ago about the Holy Spirit, and I thought so eloquently communicated that the Holy Spirit is God's loving embrace expressed to us while we are on this earth, is the ability to feel God's love, to sense His presence, to know that He's moving and working in us. And as Nigel communicated in this email, the Holy Spirit is God's work of reminding us we are valued and loved. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit as person. As we do this series, it's very easy to think about the Holy Spirit as a power or a force that we have to connect with or hear or kind of discern what he's doing or how he's doing it. The Holy Spirit is a person just as Jesus Christ was and is a person, just as the Father is a person. The Holy Spirit has feelings, opinions, thoughts, and will in our lives. We're going to, this morning, take an overview of the Holy Spirit from Genesis all the way through to Pentecost and Jesus Christ sending the Spirit among us. But we want to begin by establishing, as we talk about the Spirit, that the Spirit is not some ethereal, philosophical force. The Holy Spirit is a person. Three things that make a person theologically. A person thinks, a person feels, and a person has a relational identity knows who they are by relationships, conversations, engaging in a community. Let's see the Holy Spirit as all three of those. The first, the Holy Spirit thinks. As Luke writes in Acts, Acts 15, 28, he says, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. The Holy Spirit had thoughts, had considerations on it. The Holy Spirit thought this was a good idea. The Holy Spirit can think, has opinions, discerns, Number two, the Holy Spirit feels. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, Paul records this about the Spirit. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way that you live. The Holy Spirit can be grieved, can mourn, can celebrate. The Holy Spirit has feelings, feels and has desires for us, celebrates with us, mourns over losses in our lives and when we are living outside of God's will. Third, the Holy Spirit is relational. As the Apostle Paul, let's revisit him again, in Romans 8, verse 26, he says, the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. The Holy Spirit is relational with us, doing what we can't, sensing where we need to go, speaking into us, operating communally with us. Scripture from Genesis to Revelation shows us the Holy Spirit is not a force. The Holy Spirit is a person with thoughts, feelings, and a relational identity. 
To recognize the personhood of the Holy Spirit is to see his independent emotion and that he is continually at work in creation and in God's image bearers, working with us, guiding us, challenging us, and shaping us to be more like Jesus. It means that the power of God that we read about in Scripture is still present and moving and working among us. That it's not an idea we think about or aspire to, but it is an active work of God present in His church, present on this earth, working and moving. It means that God's involvement in this world is also not simply activity, but is relational presence and influence. That God is relationally working to us, wants to speak with you, know you, and guide you forward. And that we can speak with, listen to, and discover the Holy Spirit as He moves and works through us. So let's look at the Holy Spirit in Scripture. Let's see the story of how we interact with Him. And I'll encourage you again, Brandon preached a beautiful sermon about the Holy Spirit a couple months ago. My goal is not to reiterate what Brandon preached. You can find it on YouTube or on our podcast, listen back to that. But let's look at the Holy Spirit in Genesis. First thing we know, the Holy Spirit was involved in creation. The Holy Spirit is a creator. The Holy Spirit is there. Anybody know the first verse you see Him? Verse 2, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the Holy Spirit, maybe not there at the very, very first verse, but just shortly after, the Holy Spirit is at work in creation. Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. We see here the first thing that the Holy Spirit does in two two parts. The Holy Spirit creates, creates, shapes, makes new, breathes life into world and creation. Second thing it does in this passage, this verse of hovering over the deep, the Hebrew term is tohu vavohu, which means formless and, and void and without form, or chaos. The Holy Spirit brings order to empty chaos. The Holy Spirit creates and brings order to where there is chaos. The Holy Spirit is still doing that. That is still the primary work of the Holy Spirit, to create and bring order to where there is chaos. What this means, and the scary thing about teaching on the Holy Spirit or asking God to work in us through the Holy Spirit, is that the Holy Spirit is a creator and a recreator. And what that means for us is, oftentimes the Holy Spirit's work is to change us and to start something new and to challenge something we've been doing. He may say, you need to stop this relationship. You need to begin this new ministry, as Carolyn shared with us. You need to step out and have a new conversation. Begin to serve in a new area. Let go of something you've been holding on to. The Holy Spirit changes us and recreates in us. Tom Rayner writes this in his book, literally called Who Moved My Pulpit, about churches going through revitalization and new life. Shares a story about a young pastor, I can totally relate to this story, that he came into a church and was trying to breathe new life into it and recreate it, and he was getting a lot of momentum, and the church was growing, and there was a lot of young people in the church, and he said he learned a lot of mistakes along the way. One of them is how resistant people are to change. He said he felt like they were gaining good momentum and they were growing as a church and they were getting younger and they had new music and he dressed more casually and he said, so I finally decided it was time. My sermons were more relational and so oftentimes I would be speaking with the congregation. I'd step down off the stage and we had a huge wooden pulpit on the stage. He said, so I decided, all right, it's time to remove that pulpit. And I'll bring something in smaller so that it represents the fact that we're connected and not this disconnect of this big thing I'm preaching behind. So he says, next week, removes the pulpit, puts the new smaller pulpit in there, and just goes about his business. He said, I never realized how many angry emails I could receive in one week other than just changing the pulpit. So he said that whole week he thought about it, prayed about it, and he said, all right, I understand. 
I made this change too quickly. I didn't communicate enough to the church body. And so he, he humbled himself and was ready the next week to come in and apologize. So I'm just going to come in. I'm going to address the church. I'm going to apologize. Walk in. I obviously can't go back and go bring the pulpit back, but I will walk through the journey with them and apologize. As he comes in walking down the aisle, he hears mumbling of people around. There's an awkward silence. He looks up, old pulpit, back on the stage again. He says, I couldn't even control myself. It is recorded in church history that I yelled out, who moved my pulpit? Back to the start. We, as human beings are not always huge fans of change. We're resistant of it. We like it. We move in it. When I was first youth pastor, I worked with our young adult group. And oftentimes the young adults would say, we're doing all these new things and, and, and we just feel like we got to move, but, but the church is resistant to change. I said, just give it time. Because two years later, the new young adults wanted to change one of their Thanksgiving traditions and immediately a bunch of 24-year-olds said, no, this is the way we've always done it. I said, two years. It took you two years. You're still in your early 20s and are aware of how hard it is for us to change. But this is the Holy Spirit's job, to change us, to transform us, to recreate it, to not, and as Isaiah says, to begin to do something new in us. The Holy Spirit is involved in creation recreating and making new things in us. Also in the Old Testament, we see, moving past Genesis 1, we see that the Holy Spirit also came on particular people at particular times for particular works. This is how the Holy Spirit operated throughout the Old Testament. Particular people, particular times, for particular goals. So the Holy Spirit's a creator and He brings new things. We see this, but as the Bible goes along, he empowers people to do different things throughout the Old Testament at particular times for particular purposes. First thing we see is he comes on people to create beauty, to create beautiful things. We have this unique and interesting passage in Exodus 31 about a creative person, not a preacher, not a pastor, not a disciple or evangelist, but an artist who the Holy Spirit comes on and works through. It says in Exodus 31, Then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I have specifically chosen Basilel, son of Uri, grandson of Ur of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, expert in working with gold, silver, and bronze. He is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and in carving wood. He is a master at every craft. I have filled him to make art, to make beautiful things, to create beauty that demonstrates my nature as a creator. And we see throughout the course of history, the Holy Spirit coming on men and women to create beautiful works of art that demonstrate God's beauty. One of the best examples I can think of, my wife calls it the best art she's ever seen in person, is a trip we made years ago to Florence, Italy and got to see the statue of David in person, ourselves. Walk through this huge crowds of people, so you don't get a lot of opportunity, but I wanted to put up, this is the photo I took. I think it's pretty good. It's one of my, my favorite photos. I think I framed it really well. This is the statue of David. If you've ever seen it in person, it is way bigger than you think it is. We see it and we think like it's a person. It's like 18 feet tall, and it's on a podium, so you kind of sit under it. The statue of David is carved by, if you know history, by Michelangelo. Michelangelo was primarily a sculptor, although he also painted. Michelangelo was a passionate follower of Jesus, more than almost any of the other Renaissance artists. He was passionate. He was on fire. He came to Christ by a fiery monk who would come down out of the mountains and preach from the square, and that's how Michelangelo came to faith, and so he internalized that. At just 24 years old, they asked him to come and carve something out of this giant block of marbles, 20 foot, 10 foot wide, big block of marble. Four other artists had tried to make something out of it and couldn't. They worked with it. They said, this, this block is no good, can't work. They said, well, this kid seems to have some talent. Let's let him work on it. In two years, 
He made what has now been for 600 years one of the most beautiful works of art of Western history. And Michelangelo said how I was able to do this. He said, it wasn't that I brought David into this block of stone. I felt like he was trapped inside of it, and I was letting him out. And as I worked, I felt the Holy Spirit's power and presence guiding my hands to craft this, to demonstrate His beauty as I worked inside of this stone. We have seen God throughout history make beautiful works. The Holy Spirit is the creator presence on earth of God working and moving through us. Second thing in the Old Testament the Holy Spirit does is the Holy Spirit empowers for leadership. Holy Spirit comes on particular people at particular times for particular purposes. Famously, in Judges chapter 6, he comes on a young man named Gideon, who starts out kind of weak, ends his life also a little disappointing. But in the middle, we see the Holy Spirit come on him in leadership. In Judges chapter 6, it says, The Lord turned to him, to Gideon, and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least in my entire family. Then the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, clothed Gideon with power. He blew a ram's horn as a call to arms, and the men of the clan of Abiezer came to him. Israel had been overrun by foreign enemies. The country was in desperate need, in desperate need of leadership. God called one young man to lead them, and he said, I'm not capable of it. I can't do it. A common refrain in the Old Testament. And God said, so I will give you my spirit, and the Holy Spirit will empower you to lead my people to freedom. So we see the Holy Spirit create beautiful art, what he does in Genesis. We also see the Holy Spirit empower his people for leadership. We should find this passage so encouraging, particularly today as we talk about the Holy Spirit, that it is not about our capability, our intelligence, our training, our strength, but that when God gives us His very Spirit, He empowers us to do what we cannot do on our own. He says, you may not feel capable of this, but I am capable of this, and I will be in you and with you in the process. Third, we see the Holy Spirit in power for prophecy, to speak truth to sin, to speak truth to power. Holy Spirit creates, the Holy Spirit leads, and the Holy Spirit speaks truth to God's people. Isaiah 61, verse 1, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, Isaiah says, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. Jesus quotes this himself at the beginning of his ministry in Luke chapter 4, that the Holy Spirit comes on us to make us aware of suffering, to give us compassionate, soft hearts, and to bring the good news that the kingdom of God comes to set free captives. It's amazing what the Holy Spirit can do in our lives. He gives us the ability to think less selfishly, to think about others, to be aware of their needs in our lives. It's not just about warm feelings, but the Holy Spirit is about making a difference in our world. It is about transforming earth to be more like the kingdom of God. I find it frustrating at times, full disclosure, there are things I know I should care about and I just don't. Things I know God tells me I should care about that are important, and I just don't. And we have two options in that. One, because we know God cares about it and we don't, we can just pretend like we care about it and we go through the motions of it. Or two, we can seek the Holy Spirit to transform and change us. Because I've said to God, how do I make myself feel differently about something I don't feel that way about? He says, this is the Holy Spirit's job in your life, to transform us, to care about the things that He cares about, to be able to do the things that He does, to transform who we are into the best version of ourselves with the Holy Spirit present in us. The singer Bono says it like this, 
For all that I was lost, I am found. It's probably more accurate to actually say, I was really, really lost, and now I'm a little less lost at the moment. And then tomorrow, I'll be a little less lost, and the day after that, a little less again. That, to me, is the spiritual life, the slow reworking, rebooting of a computer at regular intervals, reading the small print of the service manual, discovering new things that has slowly rebuilt me into a better image. It's taken years, though, and it's not over yet. That the Holy Spirit transforms us, sometimes in an instant, in big moments, but often, little by little, day by day, calling out our sin and revealing to us the character of God. So the Holy Spirit, that's how He worked in the Old Testament. Came on particular people, particular times, for particular work. To create beauty, to lead people to freedom, or to speak truth into God's people. But in the New Testament, we then see an explosion and an expansion of how the Holy Spirit works. It goes from being particular to anyone at any time. We see this in Jesus, and then we see it in the book of Acts. As the Old Testament prophet Joel says in Joel chapter 2, Then after doing all of these things, I will pour out my Spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. In those days I will pour out my Spirit, even on servants, men and women alike. I think this is a key to the beauty of what Carolyn was sharing. That we are very different people coming in from very different places. And that may be due to our ethnic makeup, our our nation of origin, our family of origin, or the generation that we're a part of. And we can try to bridge those, finding common things, but that takes time and doesn't always work. What works is When the Holy Spirit reminds us that we are all made in God's image and draws us to a common purpose of leading the world into the presence of Jesus and sharing the good news that He is alive and that the Holy Spirit is the great equalizer, that each of us are connected through prayer, connected by His presence. So it goes from a particular people at a particular time to anyone at any time for the task of leading people to Jesus. The promise of the Father that He is going to do something new. And it's going to be more than just a nation, a kingdom, a location. It is going to be for all people all over the world for all time. And then, in the Old Testament, they waited. They waited to see how this would play out. They waited to see when this would come, what it would look like. And we see the first hint of it in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. The angel speaking with Mary, the mother of Jesus, replies to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. The first entrance in the New Testament to this idea that the Holy Spirit is not just coming on particular particular moments, but now filling and filling continually beginning with Jesus. Mary is called by the Spirit, filled by the Spirit. And then Mary visits her cousin Elizabeth, and she's pregnant with John in the womb. And it says in Luke 1, 41, at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leapt within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And now we see Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, transforming, empowering, beginning this new good news, beginning this new kingdom message. And then two chapters later, John the Baptist, all grown up now, answers this in Luke 3. John answered their questions as to who he was by saying this, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Baptism literally means to drench and envelop, to fully immerse. And John is saying, Jesus, as he comes, has come 
to fully envelop you in the person and presence of God. That He will come to reveal to you that God is not a distant force anymore that comes to be on particular people at particular times for particular purposes, but that God's presence and His person is now here to live with you, work with you, envelop you, transform you for all time. John baptizes with water, and water can cleanse for a time, and it can fill us for a time, and we have to drink again, or we have to clean again. We have to get another shower. I had to do it after Pennington Day because it was 94 degrees yesterday. We have to do it again and cleanse again. He says, when Jesus comes, he will give you a baptism in fire that will cleanse you for once in all time, that will be in you and continually be in you, that will consume you. And then we see Jesus live out this idea. Luke chapter 3, verse 22. The Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on Jesus like a dove. Descended, fully embraced Jesus. Luke chapter 4. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Full of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is then called into the wilderness to then wrestle with other spirits, with the spirit of temptation, with Satan himself. The Holy Spirit moving him guiding him, speaking to him. And then Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, filled with the Holy Spirit's power. This is a beautiful question that often comes up in a new Christian's life or experience or someone new to studying the Bible. We'll say, how was Jesus able to perform all of these miracles? Or when Jesus says, we can do this too, How does that make sense? He's God, so obviously He can do that. Obviously, He can walk on water. Obviously, He can heal people. Obviously, He can feed people. He's Jesus. He's God on earth. When as we study Scripture, it's revealed that Jesus doesn't perform miracles, doesn't heal, doesn't walk on water because of Jesus' incarnate nature as God. As Paul says to us, He emptied Himself of His nature as God and came and took on the presence of God of a human. He is able to do all of that because the Holy Spirit was completely enveloped in Jesus. The Holy Spirit was completely manifest in him. Jesus had no sin, which means the Holy Spirit could be entirely working through Jesus, continually working through Jesus, healing through Jesus, performing miracles through Jesus, feeding through Jesus, dominating the ocean and the desert through Jesus. That Jesus' miraculous powers on earth were not because of Jesus' divinity, but were because the Holy Spirit lived and worked in Jesus perfectly. This is why Jesus says to us in John chapter 16, verse 7, But in fact, it's best for you that I go away. If you're following Jesus, working with Him, that's terrifying. You're leaving? And it's better that you're leaving. I've seen what you do. I've heard how you teach. I know your character. I do not want you to go. If I have a choice in this, and literally Peter says this, no, can't go. I'm not going to be able to do this without you. And Jesus says, no, it's better that I leave. Because if I leave, he says, if I don't leave, the advocate won't come. The advocate being the Holy Spirit. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment, doing the same things the Holy Spirit did in the Old Testament, but now doing it continually, jumping down to verse 13. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. We see in the New Testament now, in Jesus, what it looks like a life continually lived with and in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus tells us, you can live this way too. You can have this power too. You can live with this love and this value too. By my death and resurrection on the cross, my death and my resurrection, you will be made free from sin. And as you are made free from sin, My spirit can then live on you, in you, through you, and with you. And as he lives 
in the church, my community of followers, those trusting in my forgiveness and grace, you will do the things I have done. And you will do the things you've read about in the Old Testament. You will create beauty in this world that speaks to and demonstrates the beauty of our Father in heaven. You will lead others into relationship with me. You will lead others to know me, to be with me, to care about the good things I care about. And you will speak truth, not just about an earthly kingdom anymore, but about the good news of who I am, Christ Jesus, Savior, lover, and King. The Holy Spirit will empower you to speak when you feel like you can't. The Holy Spirit will empower you to work and operate as the church, to care for the vulnerable and the hurting, to call out sin and injustice in our lives and in the world. And the Holy Spirit will work in you to recreate and rebuild this world that it will be like heaven. The Holy Spirit can speak to us and through us. The Holy Spirit is accessible to all people because of Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit is available to all people at all times for all purposes of leading people to Jesus. At this moment, I'm going to invite the worship team back up, and I'm going to set the stage a little bit for us as a church over these next weeks. As we walk through this series, we are going to be walking hand in hand with our midweek formation nights. If you've never been to one, we do them here on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. We'll have coffee out. We'll have the room set up. And what we're going to do is each idea of what we teach about the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit as person. Holy Spirit transforming us. We will then give you space on Wednesday nights to practice what that looks like. Literally, to practice what has been preached. To listen, to seek, to hear the voice of God. And on Sundays, as pastor, as leadership team, what we're committed to is to encourage all of you that this is not something that happens on Sunday morning by those of us on stage alone, by those of us with degrees or credentials. That what happens when we gather in person and those watching online is that we are the church. And the church operates through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And that when we are together, the Holy Spirit is speaking to each of you in the same way, the same manner, and the same power. It's speaking to me. It's speaking to Rachel. It's speaking to Gavin. It's speaking to Maddie. It's speaking to all of us. He's speaking to us. And my encouragement to you is to listen. Listen to what the Holy Spirit may be saying to you. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is calling you to, is guiding you into. The reason I always start with the personhood of the Holy Spirit is because our prayer life is normally 90% talking, at best maybe 10% listening. We talk more than we listen. We tell God about our day. We tell God about our needs. We tell God about what's coming up. And you should, and absolutely, open up your life. Share with God who you are and what's happening to you. But the Holy Spirit is a person who has a lot to say. And we only can hear Him when we make space and time to listen. And so my encouragement is to listen and to know that the story of Scripture and the Holy Spirit empowering men and women to create beauty, to lead others, to speak truth into areas of sin, bondage, and slavery is our calling right now. And it's not just the calling anymore of particular people at particular times with names or degrees or titles, but it's now the calling of all of God's people to discern and to hear and to shape. And my formal invitation to you is to be a part of this. Be a part of what God is doing in our church. Be a part of what God is doing in Mercer County. Discern, listen, and share what God is speaking and saying. I'll give you space to do that. I'll open up the altars here. And the team 
people just lead us in some background worship, some background music. And the altar space is a metaphor for us and the Holy Spirit meeting. It's a continuation of what happens in Acts chapter 2. Peter gives a sermon. The Holy Spirit is poured out on people. And they are called to come forward and make a decision. And as they come forward, the Holy Spirit meets them, speaks about the goodness, beauty, and forgiveness of Christ Jesus, and they're transformed. It's like the best sermon response ever. They literally say to Peter, what do we do now? He says, we're glad you asked. Come forward, repent, receive. As we close, I'm going to invite you to stand, if you can, all over the room. I'm going to invite you to active participation. Wherever you are in the room, you could take a step out into the aisle. You can kneel where you are. You can come forward to the altar space. If you're watching online, you can kneel or get in a posture or prayer. And simply acknowledge the person of the Holy Spirit and invite Him to speak to you. One simple guiding prayer. Holy Spirit, I'm here. Speak to me. Allow me to pray over you. Holy Spirit, we invite you in this moment to speak to us, to shape us, to guide us. We need you. We desire you. We want to see change in our world. We see and are acutely aware of the hurt, the pain, the division of our current world. And the reality that, God, you want to impact that through us is terrifying. We need your presence to be the change you've called us to be, to be the church you've called us to be. May you fill us, speak to us, guide us in this moment. Take a moment, invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you, make space around the room, and just invite the Holy Spirit to speak, guide, and shape us this morning.